There is only one chess game you have to learn by memory. If you want to impress some people, if you want to get some numbers from cute girls, not really, that doesn't happen. But if you want to learn the absolute essentials of the chess game in a very short and easy way, this game is for you. The game is between Paul Murphy with the white pieces and the Duke Carl and Count Isoward with the black pieces. That's right. Two people, two dudes joining forces, joining their brains to try and defeat the world's greatest mind at the time. This is the most famous game of all time and its name, A Night at the Opera. Paul Murphy with the white pieces opens up with pawn to e4, a king's pawn opening. They go pawn to e5 and we have knight to f3 attacking the pawn on e5. They go pawn to d6 to defend the pawn and Paul Murphy goes pawn to d4 to put a lot more pressure on that pawn. The Count and the Duke go bishop to g4, pinning the knight to the queen, so the knight can move without losing the queen. Now Paul Murphy goes pawn takes e5. If you take back with the pawn, that's kind of a bad move because now Paul Murphy has queen takes d8. With a check, you have to take back, you can't castle anymore, and now knight takes e5, attacking the pawn on f7, which would be a check and a fork also attacking the bishop, and white is just better. Instead of taking the pawn right away, they took the knight first. Now Paul Murphy takes on f3, they take back the pawn just now, and we have bishop to c4, attacking the weakness on f7 with the queen and with the bishop, threatening checkmate in one move. Now the duke and the count go knight to f6, interfering the way of the queen to f7. And Paul Murphy says, you know what? You have two weaknesses in this position, and I'm gonna attack them both in just one move. And he goes queen to b3, attacking the pawn on f7, and attacking the pawn on b7 as well. And the count and the duke go queen to e7, only defending the pawn on f7, which was kind of the most damaging one, so that's why they went for it. And now, if you take on b7, wait, is that just a free pawn? And it looks like the rook is also falling, but they have an intermediate move. They could go queen to b4 check. The queen is backed up by the bishop on f8. And now, well, kind of forcing the exchanges, you have to take with the queen. They take back, that's a check. You cover with something and the rook is alive. So instead of taking the pawn on b7, Paul Murphy decides to develop the knight via c3. Defending this pawn right here, threatening some nasty jumps with the knight. So a little bit afraid of this idea, the count and the duke go pawn to c6, restricting the way of the knight a little bit. And now Paul Murphy goes bishop to g5, pinning the knight to the queen, now the knight cannot move anywhere, and they go pawn to b5, attacking the bishop. This is the first blunder of the game. Notice something, the black pieces have not developed two of the minor pieces. They're not even close to castling, and they're throwing an attack to you, who has developed every piece and is ready to castle, there's something wrong here, there's something fishy. So Paul Murphy goes, knight takes b5, and that is the first brilliant of the game. Yes, I said first, there's more than that. When they take back, we take with the bishop, that is a check. If they go king to d8, you're walking straight into the line of fire, they can just castle. If you bring the king to the c-file, there's a rook lift and your king is getting hunted. So instead of that, they blocked with the knight, knight to d7. But still, Paul Murphy goes with the long castle, putting a lot of pressure on the knight on d7. It looks like this knight is defending this one, however, remember that this knight right here is pinned, so it can't even move. So it's not really defending anything without losing the queen first. And now, in view of all this attack and pressure on d7, they go rook to d8. And Paul Murphy notices something. This point on d7 is pinned. So whomever is on d7 can't really move anywhere. And this rook is really far away from bucking up his body. So he goes rook takes d7, and when they took back, rook to d1, and again, this rook can't move anywhere. This knight is not really defending this guy because it is pinned by the bishop. Now they go queen to e6, getting out of the pin from the bishop. Finally, this knight can breathe a little bit, it can move places, and they're asking for a queen exchange. Would you trade queens in this position? You have a massive attack going on, would you give away your queen? Not really, you have to be drunk to do that. And now Paul Murphy goes bishop takes d7 with a check. If you take with the queen, well, thank you for that. And if they take with the knight, which is what happened in the game, notice something, the bishop on g5 and the rook on d1 are both pointing at d8. So if we get the rook there, that would be checkmate. But there's a very annoying knight on d7. So how do we distract the knight in just one move so we can go rook to d8? Well, that's right. Queen to b8, sacrificing the queen, the second brilliant move of the game. They have to take the queen because the king can't move anywhere because of the bishop. So once they take the queen, there's rook to d8 and that is checkmate. That was an absolute disgusting game. There are millions and millions of great games you can study, but this one for sure has to be the first one. If you remember the first four moves of this game, you have to subscribe and turn on the notifications. And if you remember the first five, I don't know, you're a genius or something. Do your tactics. And I will see you in the next game.